All right. Yes. Um, if there are issues with the stream, just let me know. Um, I got through, I think, 20 minutes of Science 10 lesson before anyone said anything. And I had actually forgotten to click stream on Discord. And so none of them could watch my stream and none of them could see what I was talking about, but they were too scared to say anything. So if I make a mistake, just let me know and uh, we'll go back to that. Um, so we have um, we have actually finished up uh, stoichiometry. Um, I designed another assignment uh, that we were going to do. Um, and then as I thought more and more about it, I thought it made less and less sense to continue doing stoic, um, seeing as there's a lot of content that I still would like to get through. Um, so this week we're going to go through and we're going to traverse three PowerPoints. My goal for the rest of the uh, semester is to get through at least three PowerPoints per week. So right there in that sense, that is a lot of homework. Um, or not a lot of homework, but a lot of... Uh, time that we're dedicating to just going through notes. And so what that means is we're going to be transitioning into a period where you'll be getting one assignment per week, um, which is going to be just kind of an assignment to test your knowledge, and then probably two, maybe three streams per week um, to watch. So with heat, um, these first couple lessons, um, up until lesson three, there's really not much math that's involved. So the two lessons that we're going to, or the two PowerPoints that we're going to go through today don't have a lot of um, math I guess involved or they don't have a lot of calculations involved this is more so the background to which the third lesson exists um, and the third lesson is what your assignment this week is based off of so uh, some of the things that we need to talk about we had briefly in health science talked about a bit about energy where you get energy from but we hadn't really talked about it in too much detail the energies that we're going to talk about are chemical energy and then we're also going to talk about potential and kinetic energy and we'll define what those are in a sec but energy is the ability to do work or to produce heat so in other words you need energy to be able to do absolutely anything and so energy can can, can come in a bunch of different forms uh, light energy nuclear energy electrical energy um, and then there's other things that we are more familiar with that we would call stored chemical energy that would be like biomass petroleum natural gas coal the things that run our lives and run our houses. Chemical energy is converted into thermal energy when we break those bonds. And so in this entire unit, what we are going to focus on is the heat that is produced when we are either breaking bonds or forming bonds. Um, we will either produce or we will absorb heat and things will get colder. And so the two types of energy that we'll talk about are one is kinetic and the other is potential energy. So kinetic energy is whenever something's moving, we say that it has kinetic energy. Um, the best way of describing that would be like a rock rolling down a hill. Um, as it's in the process of rolling down a hill or as you're in the process of tobogganing down a hill, you are using or you have kinetic energy that is being expended. Anything that is an atom or a molecule they always have kinetic energy because they are always and constantly in motion. Potential energy is energy that is stored in something. So this would be like sitting at the top of the hill, you know, when you're sitting at the top of a hill waiting to toboggan and you're like slowly creeping over that edge. Well, before that process of you slowly starting to creep down the hill to slide down, before you've started that sliding process, you are all potential energy it has the potential to be converted into kinetic energy or the potential to be changed into another form of energy. That's what potential energy is. So potential energy, the reason that this exists is because of the attractive forces between molecules and atoms and that plays a huge part in chemical reactions. So when you have a bottle of, I don't know, let's say you have a bottle of sodium chloride and a bottle of uh, sodium hydroxide and you want to try to react those two together. Um, right when they're two separate bottles, that's just potential energy. It has the potential to react into some sort of chemical reaction, but it has not occurred yet. And so therefore the bonds that are holding those molecules together are stored energy and they might do work if they are broken. So if a reaction happens and we have a double replacement reaction, 
two bonds are being broken in each of the two reactants, and there's heat broken off every single time those bonds are broken apart so that the double replacement reaction can occur. So that's the potential chemical energy. Now, with the law of, of um, conservation of energy, whatever is whatever energy we have is finite. If we were to close off the entire Earth from the sun, we would have no input of energy into the planet Earth at all. We would just exist on our own. Same thing as like the conservation of momentum or the conservation of uh, matter, where you can't create or destroy matter in a chemical reaction. And that's why we have to balance these chemical reactions. With the law of conservation of energy, you cannot create or destroy energy. The only thing that you can do is change its form. And that comes into play in one of Newton's laws. Uh, it comes into play in the first law of thermodynamics. So the example that I have here is when octane, which is the main component of your gasoline, is burned in your car energy, chemical bond energy, which is potential energy. So when you're pouring the gasoline into your car, that is potential energy then gets converted into mechanical energy. So when you start the car, the pistons move in your car, you are then creating movement amongst those pistons. And you are creating kinetic energy, which is movement, and you're also creating heat, which is why in your car, your engine has the little uh, thermometer gauge to keep track of how hot your engine is getting. When we eat, our bodies convert the chemical energy of food into movement of our muscles, and heat is also the product of this conversion. So if you are somebody that is always cold and you constantly are snacking, you're slowly but surely actually heating your body in that process as well. When we turn on a light switch, the electrical energy is converted into light energy and, as you guessed it, heat energy, which is why when you reach to change the light bulb, you turn the lights off first so that they're not blazing hot and you burn your finger. When talking about chemical reactions, all the reaction in the energy, all the energy in the reaction must come from somewhere. It is not spontaneously created. Meaning, if a reaction is happening, we know heat is either being released or absorbed. We know some sort of energy is also going to be created, but it's not out of nowhere. It would have been stored in the reactants that were there previously. And that energy is stored in the bonds between atoms. So when we have when we have compounds, let's say we have sodium chloride, when we have this compound, this bond that exists, this bond that exists between the sodium and between the chloride, that is a huge storage vat of energy. And what is going to eventually happen is if that bond gets broken, a whole bunch of energy is going to be released, which allows reactions to occur. That potential bond energy is usually converted into heat. Um, that's the main form that we lose um, energy or we might lose um, products when we're doing a chemical reaction. We talked about theoretical and actual yield a little bit last week. A lot of what we're going to lose in terms of our product will be lost due to heat. That's the reason that we won't produce the maximum number of products. And so that gets us into something called kinetic molecular theory. Um, previous science courses may have taught you that molecules in a substance, no matter its state, are in constant motion. Molecules, so even within these solids here, even within these solids, the molecules are actually moving. They're just moving incredibly slowly. Gases is when things are moving incredibly, incredibly fast. Molecules are bouncing around everywhere. We are unaware of it because it's happening all around us. The energy a particle has because of its motion is called kinetic energy. And the energy that is associated with the movement of those particles is called heat and thermal energy. And what we would have done, and I think I did this reaction with you guys actually. Um, maybe it was with the grade 12s. So I'm trying to remember. But there is a, um, a film canister example. So you take a little film canister, you fill it up with water. Film canisters look, I don't know, something like this, I guess. You fill it with water, and then you add an Alka-Seltzer tablet in there. And Alka-Seltzer, what it will do is it'll bubble up, it'll turn into gas, and create a whole bunch of pressure inside the film canister. And eventually, if you put it upside down, the film canister, will the lid will shoot off, and the actual canister itself will go flying around the classroom. Now, what happens is you can change how fast that occurs. If you heat up the water or if you boil the water, 
um, that is in um, that you're putting in the film canister, the reaction will happen much faster, and those liquid molecules will start to scurry around a lot quicker, causing a lot more collisions to occur. And when collisions occur is when reactions also occur. So the whole idea of this heating things up part of the reaction is that, let's say that you have this molecule here and this molecule here. And they're moving around sort of slowly. They're just traveling around in whatever space they're a part of. They're moving around. The only way that these two molecules will react is if they run into each other. The best way to get them to run into each other is to cause them to move faster. And so if they're moving faster, it'll speed up the motion of both of these molecules until hopefully at some point they run into each other and react. Um, since the particles begin to move faster, they then have more kinetic energy and therefore the heat an object gives off is directly related to the motion of its particles. If we heat something, it will move faster. So heat is a bit uh, difficult to kind of describe or kind of put a disclaimer on, but heat is the transfer of energy. Heat always flows from hot to cold, never from cold to hot. So for example, imagine that you have an ice cube in your hand. The heat from your hand gets transferred into the ice cube. That is, fast moving particles from your hand hit the slow moving particles of the ice cube. And that interaction slows the particles down in your hand, which makes it cold, and speeds up the particles in the ice, making it warm. And normally, um, if we have an understanding of basic um, how water works, um, you would know that the ice cube is going to slowly melt and turn into the liquid state. It makes sense that it would turn into the liquid state because if we look at this last slide back here, we said that if it's a solid, i.e. if it's ice, the molecules are going to be moving as slow as possible. If it's a liquid, the molecules will be moving slightly faster. And if it's a gas, so if it's steam, if we somehow managed to heat up our hand enough to do that, then the molecules would move the fastest, and we would say that's boiling water. Uh, the second example here, the second point says, if you were holding a cold piece of metal instead of ice, your hand would eventually warm the metal to the same temperature as your body. And at that point, your hand and the metal are in thermal equilibrium. I had told you that we use this arrow sometimes in chemistry to describe when things are at equilibrium. We also talked about equilibrium um, and we compared it to another word called homeostasis when we were talking in health science. And we said homeostasis is the point where your body is going to just normalize, where everything is operating at a normal function. Same as you were holding an ice or a piece of metal, eventually your body is going to want to heat it up to the same level as your body would be. And so the two are going to interact until they reach a temperature where both are satisfied and both are at the same temperature. So heat is a form of energy. It is the total amount of kinetic energy in a sample of matter. Heat also flows from a warmer object to a cooler object. Therefore, the feeling of getting colder is not the coolness entered, entering your body, but the heat energy leaving your body. Um, we describe, SI just means standard imperial. The unit that we are going to use is we are going to use joules to calculate the amount of heat. So again, kind of the main point from these last couple slides is you aren't actually getting colder, you're just losing heat. Um, we describe that as feeling colder, but really all, the only unit that exists is how hot something is. Either it's very hot or it's not hot at all, and we invented a new word called cold to describe that. There is three types of heat transfer. There is conduction, convection, and radiation that we will talk about. And you can see kind of what the three look like there in the picture. So conduction being uh, the handle of this pot, radiation being the heat that is coming off of the um, little uh, spot on the stove there, and then convection being the transfer of cold and hot water within the actual pot itself. Okay, so radiation. Uh, this is basically how the sun 
heats up our Earth, and it's how we don't turn into Mars. There are no particles between the Sun and the Earth, so it must travel via radiation. There's no liquid, there's no gas, it's just traveling straight through the air into or onto the Earth. Uh, radiation is the transfer of heat in rays from a hot object without needing a medium to pass through, so without needing some sort of solid object. Uh, electromagnetic radiation, infrared frequencies, which are not visible. Uh, it travels in all directions from a hot object. So again, the sun heats not only the earth, but it also flows out heat every single direction coming off of the sun. And the hotter an object is, the more heat it will radiate out. So that's radiation. That's the first one. That was the one where the stove was giving off um, straight heat. Conduction. This is the transfer of heat through a solid um, by being passed from one particle to the next. And this requires contact. The conduction that we uh, saw in the first picture there was you picking up a pot, holding the handle, and it's really, really hot. If anyone's ever cooked with a cast iron pan before, the handle gets extremely, extremely warm. Um, and so you usually need to wear a glove of, or something to, uh, to pick it up. Particles at the warm end move faster and then cause the next particles to move faster and so on and so on. Um, and so in this way, heat travels uh, again from hot to the cold, as always. Conduction is the last one. When you heat a metal strip at one end, the heat travels to the other end. As you heat the metal, the particles vibrate, these vibrations make the adjacent particles vibrate, and so on, and so on, and so on. The vibrations are passed along the metal, and so is the heat, and we call this conduction. So the best way of describing this is conduction is within the same um, element or the same object um, being transferred from one particle to the next particle. That's the best way of describing how this is actually being passed along. Convection. This is the transfer of heat by the physical movement of more energetic particles from one location to another. It is the way in which particles in a gas or a liquid move upwards, carrying heat with them. Again, this was the liquid in our little pot, thinking about when you boil water, how the bubbles move around. Or if you've taken a bath, how the heat actually moves from the bottom layer of the tub. If you sit on the bottom of the tub, it tends to be a little bit colder. Or I guess if you've been in a pool before, um, the bottom tends to be a little bit colder. And that's because the heat is wanting to rise. So that is this example here. Uh, this little picture says, if your hand is above the flame, it will get hot. If it is beside the flame, it will not get as hot. Um, and this is also why like, when you're roasting marshmallows, you generally want to have your marshmallows above the flame or above the hot coals or embers at the bottom of your fire, not beside them. Uh, so here is just a little infographic of, uh, of how convection works. Um, the cool water sinks, and the hot water is going to rise, and then it's also going to cool at the surface. And so you end up with these circular motion um, happening within the actual pot itself. The other way, so we said that one of the ways of measuring uh, the amount of heat that we're actually producing is in joules. The other way of measuring heat is in calories. Um, a thermochemical calorie is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Uh, we write the units for calories as CAL, just Cal. And then to convert between joules and calories, it's a really ugly conversion. Um, it's actually these two formulas right here. Um, this is how you convert between joules and calories. You can use either one of those numbers. Um, so, for example, if we were to convert 8,181 joules and we wanted to convert that into calories, I could actually use my time sign line to do that. I know that um, for every one joule, I can make 0 0.2390 calories. And so, if I were to spit out that conversion, I would end up getting this many joules is equal to 
1,955.259 calories. So that's the conversion that you can do there. Um, so one of the things to just be cautious of here, um, this is kind of a message from um, Health Science 20 here. Dietary calories can be deceiving. A dietary calorie, which is written on the food labels, is written as a kilocalorie or a thousand calories. So if you are having a hundred calories per serving, um, what that would mean then is that you're actually having a hundred thousand actual calories per serving. So just something to be wary of. Uh, temperature is probably the most um, familiar uh, term or unit that we are used to dealing with. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of a sample of matter. In other words, it is the intensity of heat energy that is occurring. And there's two ways that we will measure temperature or that we would have measured temperature um, if we were in the classroom. One of them would be on the Celsius scale, which is based on the freezing and boiling points of water. For sure, we are the most familiar with that scale. If it is 100 degrees Celsius, we are boiling water. If it is 0 degrees Celsius, we are turning liquid water into ice. And anything below that, obviously, um, would be ice. The Kelvin scale, which was developed, is based on energy. The Kelvin scale has no negative numbers, so the lowest temperature that can ever be reached is something called absolute zero. And that would be like the absence of energy, um, where there are literally no molecules that are moving around at all. So that is the absolute coldest that something can ever be. In Celsius, it would be negative 273.16 degrees Celsius. Um, the conversion for that one's really, really easy. Uh, the key ones here, the key little formulas here are found right here. Basically, what you do is you just take whatever degree Celsius you're at and you add 273. So if we had 25 degrees Celsius, all you would do to that is you would add 273 to it. So 25 degrees Celsius plus 273, that would lead you to an answer of 298 Kelvin. Um, likewise, if you wanted to go the reverse direction of that, so this last example here, I'll do that up the top. If you had 187 Kelvin, you would just subtract 273 and you would get a temperature of negative 86 degrees Celsius. And that's just how you convert between the two of them. All right, so in terms of heat or energy, an iceberg would have um, more than a boiling cup of coffee. Although the temperature of the boiling water is much higher than the iceberg, the iceberg has more particles, and thus it will have a higher total energy. So a good way to think of temperature is the intensity of heat. Um, Coffee will have a more intense heat than an iceberg, obviously. You cannot burn yourself on an iceberg unless it's frostburn. Um, you can burn yourself on a cup of coffee, and so we would describe that one as having a higher temperature. But in terms of heat, um, we would describe the iceberg as having more particles and having a higher total energy. All right, so I'm going to save that.